Welcome to Drama Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. I'm your host, Jess Cording. I'm a registered dietitian, health coach, and author, and I'm here to help you streamline your wellness routine and establish a sane, more balanced relationship with food and fitness so you can reach your goals without losing your mind. On this podcast, we'll talk about nutrition, exercise, self care, mindset, and more. I'll be bringing you interviews and expert insight on the topics that matter to your health and wellness. Welcome back to the Drama Free Healthy Living Podcast. I'm your host, Jess Corday. I am super excited to bring you guys today's episode. Um, You know I love talking about brain health. I could nerd out about this all day, every day. I do. Um, So I am thrilled to be talking with Jim Quick. So for those of you who are not already familiar with, with Jim, so he is an internationally acclaimed authority in the realm of brain optimization, memory improvement, and accelerated learning. He brings over 30 years of experience to his work, and he's dedicated his life to helping people tap into their brain's full potential. So we talked about in the podcast episode today, some his experience overcoming learning challenges related to a childhood brain injury and just his journey to improving his own own brain function and helping others do the same. So he is, um, you know, he's the author of quite a few, quite a few, um, books. He has a podcast. Um, His latest book is the Limitless Expanded Edition. And through his teachings, he inspires others to unlock their inner genius, empowering them to live a life of great power, productivity, and purpose. Um, You will be able to find him all over the place in the media, whether that is Forbes, HuffPost, Fats Company, Good Morning America, Entertainment Tonight, CNBC, etc. His podcast boasts millions of listeners, and it's really a testament to his ability to connect and inspire others. Um, he also offers online learning courses at quicklearning.com. Um, he also is a philanthropist, funding projects ranging from Alzheimer's research to the creation of schools worldwide. Um, we do talk about what inspired him to give back and support research and resources in those areas. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so you can find them on all the places. I will link in the show notes. It's all the social media. And uh, if, if you listen at the end of this episode or check out in the show notes, Jim is also offering a gift to our listeners. So don't miss out. All right. Well, I will see you inside the episode. So Jim, welcome to the podcast. So good to be here. Thanks for having me. And I, I love the asking people's origin stories, their background, you know, why they do what they do. And I would love to hear what initially got you interested in the brain. So my inspiration was my desperation. When I was five years old in kindergarten, I had a unfortunate accident, uh, a traumatic brain injury. And from there, I would have these challenges. I would have these migraines every day as a child. I um, had balance issues. I had processing issues. So teachers, my parents, they, they would repeat themselves over and over again. And I just didn't understand. Took me an extra three years to learn how to read. I'd be teased a lot because I was always slowing down the class because I didn't get the lessons. And I remember when I was nine years old, I was being teased a little bit more than usual. And a teacher came to my defense. She pointed to me over the whole class and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And so my my challenge growing up was I had the I was put in special education. My mom became a special education teacher to help me with my learning uh, difficulties. And something I struggle with every single day, focus, memory, understanding, learning, reading. And uh, eventually when I was 18, I learned some uh, some strategies to be able to, to fix my brain and also to, you know, from going from the boy with the broken brain, I was able to fix my brain. So mission is to build better, brighter brains for, for individuals. And also because I was such a slow learner, I feel like uh, one of the most important skills for your listeners, your readers, is to really catch up, keep up, get ahead, is to learn faster. So um, those are the two things I focus on, teaching people how to optimize their brain and uh, giving them strategies to uh, to navigate this very, you know, very chaotic information overload, world full of distractions, this world that we live in. That is such a great way to phrase it, the information overload. Yeah. So both, it's, it is overwhelming. Now you talk, um, you talk quite a bit about genius, that genius is not innate, 
but cultivated. And I would love if you could share with our listeners what, what that means or what you'd like them to know about that. Well, the, the, the concept of, of genius, it has evolved, you know, over, over the years it, and depending on the cultural or the, in the intellectual context, it's generally referred to as extraordinary intellect or uh, creative power. It could um, manifest in different forms, you know, exceptional uh, creativity, uh, profound insight, some kind of uh, original thinking. Historically, genius has been associated with like, um, great thinkers. You think about uh, Marie Curie or, or an Albert Einstein, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Modern psychology looked at it more like an IQ score, but I feel like it's a very narrow um, perspective. And so the way I look at genius is, is not so much about innate talent or intelligence. It involves a great deal of persistence, passion, hard work, dedication, commitment. Many geniuses in history were known for their intense dedication and focus, their relentless pursuit of innovation or of mastery or knowledge in their field. We used to think that IQ was something that was set, that you take an IQ test when you're eight and that's your same potential when you're 88. And um, I think that's been pretty much uh, debunked. I could show any of your listeners how to do better in an IQ test. It's not fixed like your shoe size. So um, basically, modern understanding of genius is more, it's more nuanced. It's more acknowledging a blend of, of talent, hard work, creativity, and other cognitive and uh, emotional qualities. Amazing. And, you know, so if somebody is wanting to really develop that, that genius, you know, what, what's a good place to start? So working on there needs the, the I idea that it, genius is not fixed and that it can grow. Um, there are a number of elements to, to enhance genius, dedicating yourself to lifelong learning, where you have this mindset of curiosity, of growth. It's not a, genius is not a, a static state. So it's very dynamic through learning and adaptation. Knowing what we know about the brain, neuroplasticity is that your brain, you can make new connections. You can grow older, but you could, you can get wiser for sure. You know, it's also improving your memory. Um, Socrates said learning is remembering. And so we teach techniques that involve visualization, association, creating memory palaces and stories. We realize that a memory, there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's more a trained memory and an untrained memory. Something that would propel you to greater levels of genius is just uh, is being a better reader. If people have seen photos with me with Elon or Oprah or whoever, people ask how we connected or bonded. We we bonded over books, right? You read to succeed. If somebody has decades of experience and they put it into a book and you could read that book in a few days, you could download decades into days and you could be and become an expert in, in a very short period of time. Uh, I think also genius is optimizing your, your brain health. I think brain health is foundational for, for mental health. So um, since this is where genius is coming from, right? this three pound matter between our ears, prioritizing physical exercise, balanced diet, the things that you teach, adequate sleep, stress management, all of those could help you become more capable to do extraordinary cognitive feats. A couple more uh, mindfulness, some kind of mindfulness practice will improve your concentration, your mental fortitude, your clarity, your ability to focus deeply on a task is crucial for creativity or problem solving or uh, analytical thinking. And so, um, yeah, and so we've dedicated our life teaching people these skills because unfortunately, everything I mentioned, none of it's taught in school. Right. There's no class called brain health or there's no class called accelerated learning or focus or memory. And uh, so people are listening or they're reading and they're, they're struggling in these areas. It's, it's not your fault. Going to somebody and saying, hey, study or focus. Uh, it's like going to somebody saying, play the ukulele or play the didgeridoo, who's never had any training in that area. It's kind of take it for granted that school teaches you what to learn, but they're not a class, a lot of classes on how to learn. And I think the skill to master in the 21st century is our ability to learn rapidly and translate that learning to action is the ultimate edge. It's the ultimate competitive advantage. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, especially about the, the way that, you know, we are taught in schools. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm in my late thirties as we're recording this. And, you know, I, for myself, one of the first clues I really got the thing that had a lot to do with my going to the field that I'm in now is my own experience with, um, 
PTSD recovery and trying to figure out what was going on with my brain and my body and just feeling so disconnected. But one of the things that was hardest for me, I'd always been a good student, but when my brain was trying to deal with processing all of all of that, suddenly learning was so difficult. And it wasn't until you know time went on and I started to understand that you know, the effect that trauma and PTSD can have on brain and on cognition, I was like, oh, it's not, it's not my fault. It's just that I have some brain damage and I need to take steps to address this and get the support that I need. Yeah. So, just like if anybody had a challenge with any other organ in their body, you know, their heart or, or anything else, you have to take care of the hardware. Like we teach people the yeah. software on how to read faster, remember names, learn languages, give speeches without notes, remember client information, product information, all these things. That's more the software, but you still have to take care of the the hardware. And so we hear a lot about post-traumatic stress. We don't hear a lot about another phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. I'm sure you know people or you maybe have this experience where you go through adversity, but uh, you come through it and you wouldn't wish it upon anybody, but you maybe somebody who could relate to this, they, they wouldn't change what happened because going through it, they found some something, they found some kind of treasure, they found a strength, they found a trait, they found clarity, they found a purpose, they found a mission. They Like my, my, my biggest challenges was learning, right? And uh, that struggle became my strength because with with challenge comes comes change. So your, your brain is extremely adaptable. And so I think it's, it's really, it's amazing. Uh, we've discovered more about the brain in the past 20 years than the previous 2000 years combined. What we found is we're, we're grossly underestimating our own our own capabilities. Absolutely. I want to come back to what you were saying about learning faster. This this topic fascinates me. Um, for somebody who really wants to be able to learn faster, you know, any tips that you would share with them about getting better at retaining information? So memory is the largest chapter in our book, Limitless, because I feel like it's foundational, where if you can't remember something, you didn't really learn it to begin with. And I believe two of the most costly words sometimes in life are, are I forgot. You think about the consequences of, I forgot the meeting, I forgot the conversation, I forgot what I was going to say, I forgot what I just read, I forgot that person's name. You know, all these things, we lose credibility, we could lose a, hurt, a relationship, we could hurt a sale, we could waste a lot of time. But on the other side, you know, memory is a magnifier when you can easily remember the things that you need to remember. So in within Limitless and in our podcast, we just give a lot of tools and strategies on how to memorize something. Um, is there a specific area that you want to improve memory in? Yeah, you know, something I get asked about a lot is just remembering like uh, information. Like I work with a lot of people who are dealing with very serious health issues and they like can't remember what their doctor told them to do right. or like what they're supposed to do with their health. And they struggle a lot with like just keeping it all in their head. Yeah. I, th I think the starting point is the, the art of memory is the art of attention, the art of memory. A lot of people, when they forget something like a fact or something important that they needed to know, um, is the, the challenge is they forget it. It's, they were never paying attention to begin with, right? So they blame their retention, but it's really more their mm -hmm. attention. So having that attention, having that focus is so important. Um, a lot of people will read something and they'll get easily distracted. So no wonder they can't remember a lot because their mind yeah. is wandering. And one of the reasons why is nowadays we struggle with this digital distraction, right? Every ring, ping, ding, social media alert, app notification is driving us to distraction. And we wonder why we can't focus and remember the things we need to, like in meetings or with, with our family or something like that. And we know that focus is more a muscle and it's a use it or lose it. You know, but the challenge is, is not only do you struggle, people struggle with digital distraction, there's something called digital dementia. And this is a phenomenon in healthcare where we're outsourcing our memory to our devices. It's remembering stuff for us, our calendars, our to-do lists. I mean, think about growing up, how many phone numbers you used to remember compared to today, like current phone numbers. And uh, not that I want to memorize hundreds of numbers, but it should be very concerning. We've lost the ability to remember one phone number or, or a PIN number or a passcode. Or something we just read. And so starting with focus, uh, focus is a muscle. And so that's why mindfulness training is so very important. You know, I don't meditate to, I don't know, to get enlightened. I meditate because every single time when I'm quiet and my thoughts go somewhere else, but invari invariably it will, when I pull it back to like my breath or a phrase, a mantra, it's like I'm exercising my focus and I'm, I'm building those mental muscles. And so when I 
the same kind of distraction is happening throughout the day. I, I've trained my brain to come back to the moment and what's, what's most important. Another thing I mentioned that could improve your memory is visualization. Let's say you want to be better at remembering people's names, right? There's a, there's a, there's this idea where Proverbs says, what you hear, you forget what you see, you remember what you, what you do, you understand. Like you heard the name, you forgot the name. You saw the face, you remember the face. And what you do, going back to the power of practice, you get better at and you better understand it. And so your visual cortex takes up a lot of real estate in your brain. So the, to the extent people could visualize what they want to remember, that picture is worth a thousand words. Like a lot of people are better with faces than they are with names. You go to someone and say, I, I remember your face, but I forgot your name. You never go to someone and say the opposite. You never go to someone and say, I remember your name, but I forgot your face. Right. It wouldn't make a lot of sense, but we tend to remember what we see. So try seeing what you want to remember. So in the case of uh, someone's name, if you're meeting somebody for the first time, you're at a wedding or a networking conference and you meet someone named Mary for a split second, if you just take a moment and imagine the person in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bridal dress, right, getting married or they're, they're, she's carrying uh, two lambs underneath her arms, like Mary had a little lamb. It sounds kind of silly and childish. But children are the fastest learners, right? They can learn so quickly. And when you make it playful, you can see it and then you can make it a little emotional, like funny, uh, humorous, then you're more likely to remember it. So these are just like kind of little, some quick tips to be able to, so if someone's name happens to be Mark, imagine you're putting like a check mark on their forehead with a magic marker, right? And then all of a sudden, 20 minutes later, when you say goodbye to that person at that event, you're going to remember, like, oh, what a, that person, I put a check mark on their forehead. What's their name? You know, Mark. Right. It's, and it's to overcome what I call the six second syndrome. When somebody, when you learn something new, you read it, somebody tells you, you have six seconds to do something with that information. Otherwise it's, it's gone, right? You get someone's name, the handshake breaks, and then the name just disappears into the, the ether. And so what it forces you to do is forces you with this technique to focus. And then when you could picture it and feel it, you're more likely to retain it. I love that. That is, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. And it's, it's, the, what you said about the phone numbers, I'm like, it's like a miracle that I know my husband's phone number. I this probably yeah. just have had to write it so many times on phones. Yeah, and the um, thing is, is not that again, you you, sh you know, there are numbers you could be texting and calling every single day, but if for some reason you don't have your phone or it's the battery died, you're not really? going to remember it. But the act of actually trying to remember it will improve your memory because your memory is like a muscle also as well. And with modern conveniences, it's like the equivalent would be... If you had to go to the bank and it's eight blocks away, you certainly could hop into your car, or take an Uber, but then you don't get your steps in, right? Or if your apartment or office is on the third floor, you take the elevator each time. It's convenient, but there's also something to be said of being physically fit and you know exercising your body and your brain is part of your body. So at some point you can make the decision, it's convenient, but also to be able to challenge yourself so those muscles stay uh, strong. That's a wonderful way to illustrate that. And do you talk about, I thought this was pretty juicy, um, the seven lies of learning and mm -hmm. truths to replace them with. Now, I want people to read your book and, you know, visit, check out your podcast. But, you no, know, I'd love to know um, if you'd be willing to share a few of those with us. Yes. Yeah, so we, we start the, the book with really getting people's mindset dialed in. I, I believe your brain is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk is the, it's ultimately the program that's going to run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at, I have a horrible memory or I'm too old or I can't remember names, you won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you program your supercomputer not to, right? Um, our mind is always eavesdropping on our self-talk. And so all behavior is belief driven. So we start with the mindset first because the book is full of methodology, like how to read three times faster or, or how to learn languages or how to give a speech without notes. But if your mindset is holding you back, because you feel like you're not smart, you're too old, you have a horrible memory, then it's going to become self-fulfilling. So what we do is we introduce the seven lies to learning. And uh, a lie for me stands for limited idea entertain, L-I-E, limited idea entertain. It's not true that you're somebody's too old or they're not smart enough. And so one of those lies or myths is that uh, what we talked about earlier, that genius is born. And the research is is saying that it's not so much born. Certainly some people have certain innate skills and talents, right? But genius is not so much born. The truth is more genius is built through some of the things that I mentioned earlier. 
through, through proper training and dedication and curiosity, taking classes, anybody can improve their focus or their memory um, and so much more. And again, the reason I know this is I couldn't do any of these things, but when I'm speaking at uh, a business conferences, I'll often, you know, have the audience challenge me. They'll pass around a microphone and introduce themselves and I'll memorize a hundred people's names or they'll give me a hundred words or random numbers and I'll recall them forwards and backwards, but there's no way I used to, to be able to do this, you know, growing, growing up, but I, but I've trained myself to be able to do it. So it, it's nice to know that like another lie is that intelligence is fixed. And we've talked about that also as well, that intelligence is not fixed. You know, your potential is, is near limitless, but you could, you could improve your focus, your memory, your ability to learn and retain, think. And those are all the different chapters in the book. Um, and then another one is knowledge is power. You know, we say it all the time, knowledge is power. It, but I think the reality is the, the truth is knowledge has the potential to be power but it only becomes power when we utilize it. Some people could learn a lot, they could read books, but their life is no different unless they take some new action based on what they learn. I think that for every hour somebody spends reading an article or listening to a podcast like this or reading a book, they should spend and dedicate an equal hour to, to executing and applying what they just learned. Otherwise it, it just stays, you know, so many people buy books and they sit on their shelf on read. Yeah. And it becomes shelf help, not not real self help people. But another myth or a lie would be knowledge is power. And I just I feel like that if people believe that, it's half the equation. Knowing is half the battle, but acting is the other half of it. I hear that all the time in my work. You know, people will tell me I know what to do, I know what to eat, I know what not to eat, I know I'm supposed to exercise, but I don't do it. Like people always yeah. say that, and I. So, you know, why, where I come in, I'm like, well, I know that, you know, it's like, let's talk about why you're, you're not able to, yeah. to, to practice what you, what you know, because there's a lot to unpack there. And I, I, something I find people struggle with a lot that holds them back is energy management, like poor energy management or time management. And I know that that's something that you, you also discuss. And just from your perspective, what are some of the best things that someone can do to ma better manage their energy and optimize their life and maybe be able to follow through on the things that they, they want to do or know they should do? Yeah, energy is a key ingredient for staying motivated when we're exhausted. I, I think when we're going back to knowledge is power, people aren't applying what they know. Sometimes it's because they're depleted. You know, they know they should work out, but they're not doing it because they, they have no vitality or no energy. So energy is not just like focus or motivation. It's not something you have, it's something you do. So we could hypnotize ourselves with the words we use and say like, oh, I don't have creativity. I don't have motivation. I don't have a good memory. I don't have focus. You do not have these things, you do them. So the practice of taking the nouns in our life and turning them into verbs, so you don't have focus or have energy, right? A noun, you do it. There's a, there's a process for generating more focus. There's a process for generating more energy. And so um, in the book, we talk about 10 things that will move the needle for your mental energy. And energy really is the key to health, right? It's we're energetic beings. Um, so some of those things, and people could kind of rate themselves on a scale of zero to 10. So it makes very, it becomes very relevant to them. So everyone wants to know what the magic pill is for a better memory or for genius. And I realize there's no pill, but there is a process. Right. And so number one, a good brain diet, what you eat matters, especially for your gray matter. There's a whole area, a chapter we put in the book on neuronutrition and brain nutrition, talking about the best foods and uh, supplements and nootropics that will help give you mental energy for those people struggling with mental fatigue that will help you to focus, that help with your memory, that are neuroprotective. Avocados, the monounsaturated fat in avocados, your brain is mostly fat. Blueberries are some of my favorite brain foods. I like to call them brain berries. They're full of antioxidants that are neuroprotective. Broccoli is high in uh, sulforaphane, uh, which is really key to cognitive health. Things like uh, olive oil, eggs, if, if people's diet allows, the choline in eggs is a precursor to acetylcholine, which is essential for cognitive health and performance. Green leafy vegetables like kale and spinach. If your diet allows fatty fishes, getting your omega-3s through salmon or sardines, your brain again is mostly fat or supplementing with those things. Turmeric, the, their curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric is very anti-inflammatory, has great brain benefits. Walnut, they kind of look like uh, the human brain to help people remember that. 
high in vitamin E, very good, uh, very neuroprotective, dark chocolate, not milk chocolate or, or highly sugar chocolate, but dark chocolate, what's good for your mood is going to be good for, generally for your mind. So these, these are like, you know, a scale of zero to 10, you, people can rate themselves how good their, their diet has been the past week. Because on the other side of it, we'll be closer on the lower side of it is things like processed foods, you know, lots of chemicals, high sugar foods that, that spike your glucose. So that would be one thing. Another thing would be um, supplementation. And we do a whole chapter, a brand new chapter in the book, nootropics that help you focus and that improve your memory, that give you mental uh, energy and vitality. Also uh, stress management on a scale of zero to 10, how stressed out are you? Because 10, 10 well, how well are you coping with stress? So if yeah. maybe a 10 would be your coping with stress really well, because chronic stress could shrink the human brain. Yeah. Right. And so it puts you in fight or flight and it kind of holds you hostage in your survival, survival brain and holds you hostage away from your executive functioning, from your creativity, from your problem solving. So what mechanisms do you have to cope with stress? Some people use meditation, some people use exercise, some people use nature, body work, whatever, what have you. Sleep for energy, right? When you don't sleep, how, how are you functioning the next day mentally, right? It's hard to have, you already struggle with brain fog. It's hard to solve problems, hard to focus, hard to retain information, it's hard to study. So, you know, we do a whole chapter on optimizing your sleep. Some of the things that are important that move the needle, getting direct sunlight first thing in the morning for 10 minutes, your, your eyes are the only part of your brain that's outside of your skull. And uh, it helps to reset your circadian rhythm, help you sleep better at night by getting direct sunlight first thing in the morning, even if it's hazy or foggy or cloudy. Inside, if you're going through windows, the light, yeah, the, the windows kind of filters out some of the spectrum of the light. No caffeine for me. I'm very sensitive to caffeine, so I can't do caffeine past noon because it could stay in your system eight to 10 hours or more. So I'm very uh, conscious of that not exercising too close at eating or exercising too close to bedtime. Cause you want to, you want to, if you're exercising, you want to get your heart rate down, you know, closer to nighttime, get in that parasympathetic rest and digest state. The, the two things that can move the needle is uh, temperature and light, because as thousands of years ago, if we're hunter gatherers, we would know it'd be time to go to sleep because it would get darker and it'd get colder. But in modern homes, there's a thermostat. We have indoor lighting, so it doesn't have to get darker or colder. So you want it cooler in the bedroom, you know, where you sleep, not so cold where it's like distracting you and, you, and you're, uh, you're shivering. And, you, and, and that could be easily, you could even take a warm bath or a warm shower. The Epsom salt in a bath is, the magnesium is wonderful for relaxation. Also, when you get out of that warm bath or shower, your core body temperature drops, which is a signal to produce melatonin which is uh, the hormone that helps you relax and, and go to sleep and stay asleep. Keeping it dark, which also means staying off our devices because the screens emanate this, this blue light, which can confuse your mind into thinking it's still daylight. And so you don't produce the melatonin to be able to go to sleep. So, so again, energy is not something you have. It's something that you can generate and focusing on good nutrition Exercise, great for energy. When you exercise, you create uh, BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotropic factors, which is like fertilizer for, for your brain uh, to make new connections. When you exercise, you create uh, the dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, which is uh, you know, these chemicals that help you to, uh, to perform and energize you, to help you to, to feel great also, also as well. So lots of things you can do for, for limitless energy. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. I know our listeners are going to love that. I, I, I have a big focus on sharing actionable tips and tools because mm -hmm. I think that people are overwhelmed. They're, they're busy. They want to just be able to do something and notice a benefit. And these are all wonderful suggestions. Yeah, that's what we do with the book and the podcast. It's just quick. My last name really is quick. K W I K. I didn't change it to just my father's name, my grandfather's name. I didn't change it to do the work that we do. But I feel like these kind of quick tips that they, people could try that will give them an immediate result. And that's, uh, that's, that's our focus. I love that. Now, I know you've shared a lot of great tips and tools with me today. And I just wanted to see, is there anything else that you just really wish that, you know, when it came to things that people can do to support optimal brain function, you know, is there something that you wish was just common knowledge or something that you'd love everyone to just walk away from today's episode with an idea of? Yeah. Just, just knowing, presencing this idea that our brain is our number one wealth building asset that we have, and it's the most under leveraged. If your listeners have a team, even it's the collective intelligence and brain power of that team that really allows us to, to thrive today. 
It's not like it was hundreds of years ago where working out in fields or factories where it's more brute strength. Today, it be rewarded for our brain strength, right? It's no longer our muscle power, today it's our mind power. And the faster you can learn, the faster you could earn. Because knowledge, while well, it could be power, it's also profit. And um, so I guess what I would say is I always wear a brain on my shirt. Uh, if people are watching this, you know, on video, because what you see, you take care of, right? Because it's in your constant awareness. You see your clothing, you see your car, you see your hair, your skin. You're more likely to take care of it because if it's slipping or degrading, like you're, you, you see it, right? And, but you don't see the, your brain. And so in pictures on social media, if we're connected there, or I'm always wearing a brain shirt because uh, I, it brings this, your awareness to it, or I'm pointing to my brain because you want to take care of the thing that takes care of us. And even something simple, like going through the day and asking yourself this dominant question, is this good for my brain or is this bad for my brain? Something so simple that any of us could do is what I'm watching. Is this going to be good for my brain or bad for my brain? Is what I'm eating right now, is this good for my brain or bad for my brain? The people I'm spending time with, is this good for my brain or is this, is this holding me back? And so this activity or doom scrolling at night, is this good for my brain or is this impacting my sleep and my, my levels of stress? And so I think my message would be your brain is this incredible supercomputer, but it doesn't, doesn't come with an owner's manual and it's not user friendly. And any piece of technology or, and it always tells you how to use it but your brain doesn't have that. So that's why I wrote Limitless to be an owner's manual for our brain. And, you know, as we grow older, you know, I'm, I'm in my fifties, right? I lost my grandmother when I was seven to Alzheimer's. So I'm very conscious as we grow older and you want to stave off brain aging challenges. And so this is something, it's kind of like, let's say you were given a car when you, you were at driving age, right? But this is, the only thing it's free, but this is the only car you can have for the rest of your life, right? How, how well will you maintain that car, right? If you had to use it for decades, well, well, when we're born, we're given this body and our brain is part of our body. And this is the vehicle we have to go through our days, go through our life. And so taking care of it, I think is so very paramount. I think, you know, good brain health is the foundation for good mental health also as well. And, um, you know, and just, you can learn about our brain and we can make it fun also as well. And if you're struggling right now because you're distracted or you're overloaded or you're forgetful, there's resources out there that'll give you hope and real help. Because I, I truly believe that there's a version of yourself that's patiently waiting. And the goal is we show up every single day until, until we're introduced, you know, to that, to that person. And because of neuroplasticity and all these amazing phenomenons of the brain, it's not fixed. So we're not regulated, limited to our current situation. Like we don't have to downgrade our goals and dreams to meet the current situation. We can decide to upgrade our mindset, upgrade our motivation, upgrade the methods we're using to be able to meet those bold, audacious uh, dreams and goals. There, there's a quote in Limitless that says, life is the letter C between the letters B and D. Life is C between B and D, where B stands for birth and D stands for death. Life C, choice. Because every day we have a new chance because we can make a new choice. You know, that these difficult times, they could distract you. These difficult times, they could diminish you. Or these difficult times, they could develop you, right? We ultimately decide with, with our choices that we make. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely optimistic for, for people, everyone that's listening and watching and reading. Because, uh, you know, we're all in this quest together to reveal and realize our, I think, our, our fullest potential. And, and we already have the superpower within us. Right. We we're born with it. You know, I say like life is like an egg that if an egg is broken by an outside force, then life ends. But if an egg is broken by an inside force, life begins, right? It hatches. And so great things begin on the inside. And if people are listening and watching, reading this right now, then my message to everybody is you have greatness inside of you. You know, you have genius inside of you. And now, now is the time to let it out. I love that. Thank you for sharing so much. Thank if you, Jess want to check out your podcast, your books, yeah. you know, what's the best way for them to do that? And they can go to quickbrain.com, K-W-I-K brain.com has links to everything. We put a link in um, our social media. So you could take a free one hour um, masterclass on accelerated uh, speed reading, free as for gift. There's videos there. Also, to, and I bring people on stage, show you people how to remember names on video, which is, I think, one of the most important business etiquette networking skills there is. 
podcasts. If you're if you're a fan of podcasts, just search my name, Jim Quick, in your podcast app, and we have near 400 episodes. Every episode is only 20 minutes long. And um, yeah, we're very proud of Limitless. We have over a million copies sold in 40 different languages. We donated the proceeds to, to build schools for children in need in Ghana, Guatemala, Kenya, and also Alzheimer's research for women in memory of my grandmother. Women are twice as likely to experience Alzheimer's than men. And yet most of the research is done on, and treatments are done on male brains. And so I'm just very passionate about you know, women's brain health. So people can find out more about the book wherever they get books uh, or go to limitlessbook.com. We have a few gifts for people as a thank you for supporting our work. Amazing. And we'll be sure to link to all of that in the show notes. Oh, you're the best. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Um, this is a question I ask all my guests because I love that there's just so many ways to interpret this um, and it's ever evolving, I think, for, for each of us. But today, at this moment in time, uh, what does healthy living mean to you? Healthy living. Healthy living for me is about whole self care, meaning it's your whole self. It's your, you know, your emotional well-being, your mental well-being, your physical well-being. You know, it's about sleep and, and nutrition. It's the whole, it's the whole thing. And so I, I would say for me, healthy living would be remembering that you are responsible for your own health. And it starts with our mind, that you are the pilot of your mind. You're not the passenger. And, uh, and the, the potential really is, is, is limitless. And I, I just want to remind everyone that self-care, when we're talking about healthy living, self-care is not selfish. And, um, and part of self-care also, besides eating the best brain foods and, or going to the spa or whatever, part of self-care is self-love. Just look, looking in the mirror and seeing that person reflected back and, and loving that person because that person is still standing, you know, no matter what they've, they've been through. And if people are struggling right now, I want to remind them that they, they inspire people around them with their grit and their grace. And um, we never know the battles people are fighting behind the scenes. You know, in social media land, everything looks greener on the other side when it's really like could be greener because of the, the filter someone's using on social media. There's a lot of artificial turf out there when we're comparing our lives to the highlight trailer of everybody else. But I'm thinking like, you know, do you? Don't compare yourself to anyone else other than the person you were yesterday. Do the best you can with what you have and so it will be enough. Uh, that, would, that would sum up healthy living for me. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, thank you for being a guest today on the show. I so appreciate your time and your expertise. This was, this was a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I give a gift to everybody? No, absolutely. There's um, an assessment we created for everybody, just like there's personalized medicine based on genetics or personalized nutrition based on a microbiome test. Learning is also very personalized. People read different, they, they remember different. So we created a, a brain animal dominance quiz People can get it at mybrainanimal.com. There's nothing to buy. It takes four minutes to go through. But based on your dominant brain animal, we give you suggestions on, on how to read, how to remember, how to parent, how to communicate, how to sell, how to hire, manage based on brain types. And there's four major brain types. So I would challenge everybody to, to take the quiz, post it, you know, um, tag Jessica, tag myself. So we see it on social media and, um, you know, share one thing in the post because the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. You know, share it with your friends, your followers, your family online. And because you tag us, we get to see it. I'll repost some, you know, my favorites. And um, we'll actually gift out a few copies of Limitless into your community just as a thank you. Put it out randomly. Thank you. That is so generous. You guys, doesn't that sound awesome? Yeah. So um, thank you, Jim. I so appreciate you making time to chat today. It's been Wonderful having you on the show. And for all you guys who are out there listening, whether you're, you know, on your devices, taking a walk or doing chores. I know I like to listen to my podcast when I'm cooking or cleaning. Whatever you're doing, I hope you found this episode illuminating, insightful. And if you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. They really do matter and help me to continue to bring you great guests like today's guest, Jim Quick. As always, guys, thank you for your time and your energy. Have a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Drama-Free Healthy Living with Jess Cording. We'll see you next time.